Hi hey everyone, and uh, welcome to the Rush FM, a podcast where design and business meet in the same place. Weekly talks with industry experts on how they do it. Let's begin the show. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Marty Newmeyer. Hello, Marty. Hi, Eugenio. How are you doing? I'm doing great, I'm doing great, thank you. Can you introduce yourself? I'm Marty Neumeyer, and I'm the uh, Director of Transformation for Liquid Agency in Silicon Valley. And I've written um, seven, almost eight books now on uh, branding, design, innovation, management, those kinds of topics. How did you get into the creative world? You know, I, I uh, went to school to be a graphic designer way back in the 60s. And... Uh, learned graphic design and then started maybe started a little company and uh, then figured out how to start writing copy. So I was writing a lot of the things I was designing, uh, which led me into writing articles and uh, being a design journalist and eventually figuring out there's such a thing as strategy. And uh, that seemed where the most need was in, in uh, at least where I was working in California, is helping companies understand what they're doing. Um, you mentioned that you are the director of transformation. Uh, what exactly is that? It, I help uh, Liquid's clients. So Liquid, Liquid Agency is a, a, a brand strategy and culture design firm You know, in California. Mm-hmm. We have about anywhere from 50 to 100 people at any given time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm involved in helping clients uh, um, sort of find their direction in the beginning. Um, and I also go around the world giving talks about my subjects, and, and that attracts various clients to, to Liquid Agency. So I'm kind of a, um, you know, what would you say, a thought leader at large, I guess you'd say. So mostly just spend my time writing books and traveling to talk about them. In one of your uh, books, you said that your brand is not your logo. Can you explain that? Well, it's a misconception that um, I had to fight my whole career. Um, you know, you know, I'd, I'd be working with a client, let's say, on a, uh, an important package design, and the CEO would walk in the room and he'd say, well, I like that one there, but could we make the brand bigger? And I used to think, no, wait a minute. He means the logo. <laughs> and, <laughs> and sure, I suppose we could make the logo bigger, if, but that's not going to make the brand any bigger. <laughs> the brand <laughs> is something else. And so I had to think of, well, what is a brand? You know, because a lot of people say, uh, refer to a product as a brand. I like that brand. Or some people say, well, you know, a brand is the promise to the customer. It's what you promise them. Okay, sure. Uh, other people say, no, the brand is the sum of, of all experiences that you give to customers. And I think those are all parts of branding, but I don't think it's really the brand. Those are all things that companies do. You know, they create logos and products and they give experiences and they promise things. That's all, you know, that's fine, but that's that's like one-way communication. It's what you communicate that counts, and that communication is in the mind of the customer. So the customer determines what the brand is. You just give them a lot of stuff so that they can make up their mind about who you are. You know, what they think you are is really your reputation. So I think of branding as more like a, maybe a commercial reputation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also in one of your books, you mentioned that you say that while everybody zigs, you should zag. What exactly do you mean? Well, you know, we learn how to do things human beings by looking at what other people do and we say, oh, that's cool, I'll do that, you know, I can do that. And we copy and we end up learning how to do it that way. But we're, but we never get any, we never do anything new by doing that, right? We learn what other people learn, but we don't ever go into new territory. So uh, if if you don't do anything new, you can't really own uh, um, a business area or a strategic area all you can do is compete with somebody else who is already there so you know you can't be a leader by following the leader you just can't 
you have to be the leader, and the leader is someplace is somebody who takes you someplace new. So uh, when everybody goes one way, you have to go the other way, even if you don't know how. You're going to have to figure it out. And those are the companies and the products that uh, create new new wealth, new value by doing something that that no one's done before. How companies can find and design their Zag? Um, the simplest way, and <clears throat> probably the hardest way, is to uh, complete a very simple sentence called that, that goes, um, "Our brand is the only blank that blanks." So, in the first blank, you put the category. Our, bland, our brand is the only motorcycle that. In the second blank, you could put um, that turns you into uh, a modern American cowboy, and then the brand would be. Harley Davidson, you know, or something. So, but but you have to have something. Uh, the first blank b- blank describes where you're competing, and sometimes you could c- your category that you're competing is competing in can be so new that you own it, and that's all you have to say is we're the only electric car. And if you're the only electric car, you're done. Um, but since there are other electric cars, you mm-hmm. have to say why yours is different. So that second blank is really important. And if you can't say that in a really simple, compelling way, then you don't have a zag. You, you, you're still just competing with everybody else. And when you do that, you have to lo- keep lowering your price to win. Mm-hmm. So you want to be in a category that no one else owns, which is in people's heads. It's not something you say. It's something they say about you. Uh, you have to own that category, and um, people have to value it enough to pay you whatever you want for it. So that's how you make uh, you know higher higher margins. Otherwise, you know when, when companies just keep sort of competing head to head and they do the same thing, they compete away their profits. They keep lowering their price uh, until there's no profits left. Yeah, and they then they go out of business. <laughs> then they go out of business. <laughs> um... One of the most uh, powerful principles in building a brand is, uh, you mentioned that it's focused alignment. And brand alignment is the practice of linking your business strategy to the customer experience. So how can a company build uh, brand alignment? You have to know who you are, first of all. So um, so you asked me, who, who are you? Uh, that's the first question I would ask a company is, who are you? Then I would say, what do you do? What category do you compete in, and why does it matter? You know, why do why should anybody care? And you need to be very clear about those. And when you are, then you can start creating experiences. Let's call them touch points, where your brand touches uh, customers that that express that perfectly. So you have to really know those things first. So we, you know, the way we do it is we have a, a matrix that we fill out, and we make sure it all makes sense, and that. You know, you know what your purpose is, and you know who the customer is. You know uh, what they need from you, and you know why your solution to that problem is unique, and and so forth. And then you can start um, making experiences for for customers that that pay off on those things, that express those things perfectly and uniquely. So you would say that one of the important things would be to find your brand purpose first. I mean, why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, the company purpose, I would say. Yeah. So, why are you in business beyond making money? That's the question. Mm-hmm. Beyond making money, uh, because if you're not, and all you care about is money, what's going to happen when you're not making any money? You just temporarily not making any money. You probably just quit and try something else that looks good. Yeah. And yeah. just keep doing that forever. So, um, if you have a purpose, you tend to stick with it longer. You believe in what you're doing, and when things aren't going well, you just look at look at way, for ways to do it do it in a different way so you can succeed. So that's why that's really impor- uh, important. But purpose does not make you different. Usually, mm-hmm. other your competitors may have the same purpose. Mm-hmm. So you still have to figure out what what makes you different. Why why is your offering unique and also compelling? So it's it's a question of being good and different. So how can a company, um, let's say I have a product or a service and so on, how can I know if I have what it takes to be great on the market? Well, first of all, you need to feel confident that you have the experience, like you have, you know, you can do it, you can do the work, you have the skills, the people, 
all that. Um, then you have to make sure you have credibility for that. In other words, the world has to see that you have the experience and, and that has to make sense to, to customers that you're the right ones to do this. And then you need courage to be different. And that's not easy to come by because there are financial consequences for making mistakes. So if you don't have the courage to do something different and um, deal with any problems that might cause along the way, then you probably don't have what it takes and you're going to end up just um, going with the pack and making a minimum amount of profit. Because of so many products um, nowadays on the market, uh, you mentioned that products should uh, companies should not offer more products, they should offer less products, but better and different. You know, companies are great at creating lots of stuff. Yeah. I mean, the people are in general. We're, we're really good at adding things. We're not good at subtracting. Mm -hmm. um, we always want more, more, more. And that's actually not what customers want. They're, they're, they're drowning in clutter. They're drowning in choices. What they want is just the right thing. So you have to really, uh, you know, that's, that's how Apple succeed, has succeeded for so long, is they don't uh, make anything they can make. They can make a lot more than they're making. They, they pick a few areas they want to excel in that they want to own, and then they put all the, their uh, resources behind that thing, and they do one thing at a time. And sometimes they make mistakes, but they're not just trying everything. They're not, because that just, that just uh, clutters the world with stuff that most people are not going to need, and it makes their brand you know, obscure, makes it foggy in people's mind. They don't know who you are. You know, if you're making a lot of stuff, they'll just say, oh, the company that makes everything. Well, that's not a position. You can't really own that. So, so they're very careful about what they make and they only do something if they think they can do it really well and really differently. So how designers can help companies um, differentiate and make their products, let's say, more different and better? Well, I think you start have to start by asking asking the questions. You know, uh, you have to ask your client or the CEO or whoever you're working with, like, you know, who are you? What do you do? Why does it matter? What is that um, different and compelling thing that you own in the market? Make sure you understand that, and uh, more importantly, make sure they understand it because that's where I found the problem to be as a designer. Um, I would kind of want to know what they were, you know, what are their expectations for this work that I'm doing? Um, how is it going to add to their success, to their, how's it going to add value? And when I asked these questions, they wouldn't really know the answer or they give me some vague answer that, that told me that really they don't know. They're just doing what everybody else does. They're just uh, playing it by ear, as we say, you know, they're making it up as they go along. Um, and that's, it's hard to be successful as a designer if you don't know what the company's doing and they don't know what they're doing either. So when I used to ask those questions, at least half the time, I wouldn't get a clear answer. And then I'd realize I have to back up I have to say, you know, what you really need is, um, you know, a, a brand position. You need a zag. You need to know who you are before we can really do anything important for you. Sure. We can do a website or we can do a logo, but. But, but why, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's, what do you expect from it? And if they don't have big expectations from it, then you're not going to get paid very much for it. <laughs> it's not important to them. Yeah. You gotta, what's that important thing that you can do for them? And sometimes you have to keep asking why uh, a few times to get to the real problem and then say, hey, you know what, I can help you with that more easily than I can help you with this uh, very surfacey, simple problem that you think you have. You have a bigger problem than that. I'd love to help you with that. Mm -hmm. So work your stream, you know, go up, go up and find a bigger problem to solve. Yeah, 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 I understand. So because why I'm asking this question is because nowadays everybody's obsessed with this whole thing of design thinking and mm -hmm. apply design, design thinking into everything they do. What's yeah. design thinking for you? Uh, well, the easiest way to understand design thinking is to compare it with, uh, the, you know, traditional business thinking. Mm -hmm. And so traditional business thinking has two steps to it. You know something and you do something. You can't do anything without knowing something first, right? So you know uh, what you're going to do because you learned in business school what you're going to do or you learn in design school what people do in this situation. 
or you read it in a book, you, or you took a class, you, you went to a lecture and heard about how to do it. So you have some sense of how to do something, and you move directly from there to doing it. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that the information you have is already old by the time you have it. It's, it was applied to some other problem before, and mm -hmm. things change all the time. So um, if you really want to be different and you want to be innovative, you can't just apply the same solutions to everything just because you read about it someplace or, or worked before in your last company. Yeah. <laughs> you can look at it fresh. You have to go back to first principles and look, look at it fresh, fresh each time. So um, the way to do that, is you add a step in between making and doing, call, I mean, between knowing and doing called making. So instead of no, do, it's no, make, do. So the making step in the middle is a process of imagining new, new outcomes, new solutions that weren't on the table before. They just weren't there. You use your imagination to do that, and then you make them more real by prototyping them. So it could look like this. Or it could look like this. Or here, let me give you a drawing. It'll look like this. Oh, here's a mock-up of how this product would work. Oh, here's a little, you know, here's a rough approximation of it. Uh, suddenly, you have more choices. You know more all of a sudden because you've made these things. You've shown them around. Maybe you've tested them. Now your options are wider. And so when you choose something, what you do is, is going to end up something. It's going to be different, probably different. So no, uh, making changes knowing, and it also changes doing. So that's, that's the whole essence of design thinking. It's the making step in between knowing and doing. So, so that's it. That's why it's so important. It, it, it's crucial in innovation to use design thinking. It's called a, a abductive, abductive thinking, abductive. Instead of deductive or inductive, it's a different kind of thinking that says, what if? It's a what if kind of thinking, and you you take an approximate, you, you come up with a hypothesis and you test it. So that that didn't really exist very much in business, except with a few geniuses like Henry Ford and people like that who didn't even know they were using it. You know, they were just they were not. But you know, nowadays people have to be innovative all the time to succeed, so they really need to to, to do this. And I, and you can use it at any level of business, from the the you know and being an intern to being a CEO. So people like Henry Ford just like discovered it by accident. <laughs> I think they just thought, and I think they had developed the knack of thinking that way uh, without having a name for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's interesting. And let's say that a company wants to stay in the in the front of the pack all the time. I mean, on the market and be a leader in their niche. How can how can they become uh, the front and stay uh, all the time? Well, to do that, really, you have to create a culture of innovation. Mm -hmm. And companies have usually a culture of uh, execution. It's a, it's a military model, right? Um, instructions uh, come down from the top. Um, it doesn't work that way with innovation. Uh, it, um, ideas move all over the place. So they're, they go in, they're omnidirectional. So you have to have a culture that allows for people to experiment to um, put forward heretical ideas, to try out things, that kind of thing. So that means building a, a culture. It also means having an innovation pipeline. You have to have products and ideas in, in, the, in progress all the time um, so that they're always moving through. You can't just capitalize on the thing you were successful with and keep doing that until it dies. You have to have something new in the works all the time. And so that's a... That's a um, a habit, a sort of a corporate habit you have to adopt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how can the company then create this culture of nonstop innovation? Um, through through a process called culture design. And that's that's what we do. That's that's the new thing that we're doing at Liquid is mm -hmm. figuring stuff out. And so it's it's all about how people work together, um, how teams work together, how individuals work, and usually it's a combination of individual brilliance and team brilliance. It's how people are rewarded. There's so many things, you know. So in my book, Design the Designful Company, I explain uh, 16 uh, levers that you can pull uh, to be more innovative as a as a culture. But um, and there are more than that. So you know, it's um, it's it really takes a deliberate um, 
program to change from the culture that we're all used to to something that allows a company to be innovative at will anytime it wants. Mm -hmm. Can we go over those uh, some of those 16 points you mentioned about? Um, so we just give more insight. Well, I'll tell you about one because it's it, it's so powerful. I'm just surprised that no one else uses this, and maybe because it's it doesn't apply to small companies as easily. But um, you know, I've gotten to a stage where I get to work with. I'm lucky. I get to work with large companies and work with CEOs who have some power to change things. <clears throat> but um, this particular example didn't come from the top exactly. It was it was supported at the top, but it started in the middle. So this was for HP, Hewlett Packard, uh, many years ago. So it was probably like 15 years ago. Hewlett Packard had been a company that was worldwide and very uh, distributed. Oh, the decisions were distributed, meaning it wasn't very strong at the top. It, they let every region, every business make their own decisions. And so as a result, it looked like there was 150 Hewlett Packards out there. You know, they weren't using the same look and feel, everything looked different, the, they ran their little companies differently, it just had an HP logo on it, and that was really all. The problem was that people didn't really know what HP was, it was just a big electronics company, and there were other ones, so why why do business with HP? So that was the problem. So um, we did some work um, as part of a larger team to, to define who they were, and um, the answer was that they're the invent company. They're a bunch of engineers and they're all about inventing and also letting you invent your business with their equipment and systems and so forth. So invent became the thing. Okay, now we have something. We still have the problem where no one in the, in the company wants to work with anybody else. They all want to do it their way. Uh, and, and, and trying to change that culture overnight would be, you people would quit. You know, it's just like, I didn't sign up for this company to be told what to do. You know, that's the thing. So rather than do that, we seduced them into doing the right thing by using a sort of gaming uh, idea, which we didn't think of as gaming. We just thought of it as a sort of competition. But what we did is we created a um, an annual brand competition for the whole company. So everyone in the company once a year could get a call for entries. And, and find a category that made sense for what they were doing, if they were managers at all. So not just the usual categories of, you know, advertising and design and things like that, but, you know, partnerships and pro internal processes, all this kind of stuff that adds up to a culture. All right, so, so um, they had a call for entries, and if, if they won an award, they would be invited to go to a, a big three-day event with all the other winners where they would see really, you know, celebrity speakers. They would get to hang around with each other. They, they'd get a trophy. They'd have a big dinner at the end. They'd be videotaped, all this stuff. Okay, so, so there was that. After that event, we took all the winners and we um, – interviewed everyone and 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 uh, turn those into lessons that would go on the internet so everybody could see why that person or that team won an award what did they do that was so good i never thought that was so good mm -hmm. well you read it and you go wow that's pretty smart and at the end of that little article about those winners would be five takeaways five lessons you can learn about to apply to your own work so people would see the examples of these people being made into company celebrities and they go, geez, I want to do that. And so they try harder and they'd start changing how they would work. And they saw that, oh, the biggest award is when you win as a team. Oh, that's what we want to do. We want our team to win because that's the biggest award you get, right? So they suddenly started working with other departments and sharing and all this kind of stuff. So all these behaviors changed because they wanted to win this thing. So, um, okay, so then we had the, this online magazine that talked about why people won and who they were and how great they were. And then we took those lessons and we made those into um, uh, workshops. So uh, how can you um, design an award-winning campaign with hardly any money? That's a good topic because not, not everyone has a lot of money for everything. So how do you do that? Well, you use concept. You, use, you, you think better. You think harder. 
well, how do you do that? Well, I don't know. We'll teach you. You know, let's have us let's try this. Let's try to learn some design thinking. You know, so we've we'd we'd have this uh, traveling uh, um, school that went around the world, and for three days, people could take the classes they needed. So the company um, leaders could look at the winners and the losers of this competition and see which divisions needed the most help and send the school to them. Okay, so every year, everybody got smarter and they saw what was winning, um, right? Yeah. And the winners were by the company, so they were actually shaping the company by choosing the winners. That's nice. So it's a way to, it's a way to lead uh, in a very positive, fun, competitive, uh, game-like way. So, um, yeah, that cost a lot of money for them to do, but not, not compared to how big they were. It was nothing. It was the cheapest thing they could have done. They've been doing it for about 10 years now, and um, it, it really helped to get everything to look alike. And, you know, so so that's, that's a culture program that you can do um, that brings it all together. So that's, that's, that's a major one. But there are lots of little things, just like encouraging ideas, you know, encouraging people to come up with new ideas. Like, you know, um, Google famously gives people 10% of their time to work on anything they like. I don't know if they still do that, because to me it takes more than just saying that. You've got to manage that program. But um, but those are the kinds of experiments you see, and um, you know, lots of things like that. But knowing the difference between teamwork and individual work, and that you need both of those, and how to make those work together. You have to do it kind of alternately, where you give people time alone, and you also give them time in a group. Mm -hmm. And you have to facilitate these groups uh, so that they're not just free-for-alls or, you know, black hatting sessions where you know someone says well i'm a devil's advocate and i think you know you just like there are ways to get around that you know do you know the uh edward de bono uh system called uh six hats thinking have you ever heard of that no no it's a book by edward de bono mm -hmm. he's a thinking genius um that's the best thing he's ever done i mean mm -hmm. that that little system of um generating ideas in a group is so beautiful that, you know, I use it all the time. I talk about it in many of my books. Um, it's just so simple. And it gets rid of this uh, devil's advocate thing that you always run into people who just say, I'm, I just want to tell you that why this is not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's definitely room for that. And sometimes things won't work and you shouldn't even bother with them, but, but you need to organize those thoughts. So you get those all together and you don't have people just shooting down good ideas or, mm -hmm. you know, likely ideas willy willy nilly they have to you know you have to organize that so that six hats thinking is is a great uh tech you know cultural technique that you can mm -hmm. use mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you also mentioned about uh group work and individual work do you think it's also important just to encourage individual work so people can work alone in their ideas and then yeah. work together in a group yeah, I mean, some people are really good alone and not so good in a group, and then vice versa. Some people good in a group, not good alone. But most people um, can produce different things in different situations. So there, there are times when you need to be need to concentrate for extended periods of time, uh, and in a group, it's too hard because there are conversations going on all over the place. So you need to really focus. Then you need to bring those ideas to the group and be ready to defend them, to sell them, to persuade people to change your idea based on what they say, all those things. But you have to bring ideas to the meeting uh, unless you're so quick that you think of them right on the spot. But very few people can do that well, so I wouldn't expect that. Um, so people need time to think alone. They need group uh, experiences to develop those ideas. And so it's, it's kind of like... Uh, I call it uh, concertina creativity, it's like a concertina. You know, it goes like a, an accordion; it goes in and out. You, you, you go go out and go by yourself, then you come together and you share, and you go out and you just keep doing that alternately. But you also need um, people to facilitate those group sessions. You can't just have them be free free for alls. So all this um, process of designing the culture is it something that? Um, employees take as an example from the top management i mean uh, lead by example is it something that applies yeah. to this thing yeah well, the, uh, the ceo has to stand up and say this is what we're doing together this is how we're going to work this is the goal and it can be a very broad goal he doesn't have to teach anybody how to do it but he has to support it 
fund it uh, and keep talking about it forever. Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't do that, you're just not going to have that kind of culture. You're going to have some other culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You need to be very clear what you expect from people. So, um, but then it's probably going to be people at the second level down that manage this kind of thing. You know, I, I recommend that companies get a CBO, uh, uh, chief brand officer, somebody that's at the top level in the C suite of the company, at the C level. You know, so, um, you know, chief brand officer is the person who's in charge of what happens on the outside of the company. Mm-hmm. So the inner between what the company's doing and what the customer experience does. So that's a very high level position. It's, it's not something that a marketing manager should be doing. Marketing is something else and marketing is under branding. Branding is over everything. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's equal, it's equal with the business itself. So you can't just say, you know, you're, you're going to do branding part time. Um, that's only if you think branding is sticking logos on things. Yeah. <laughs> so, Let's suppose that we design this culture of innovation. So we're creating great products, um, really good products. We're ready to sell them. And if we switch to the customer part, you mentioned that customers today don't like to be sold. They tend to buy in tribes. So companies should focus not on USPs, but on UBT, like unique buying tribes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we we are always thinking about um, customers as individuals, which they are, but they tend to go with the herd. They tend to do what their friends do. They they have a uh, they identify with a tribe or several tribes. The tribe is in branding is a group of people that um, have similar interests and a similar point of view. So about something, and they talk to each other. So that's your tribe. If they don't talk to each other, then they're not in the same tribe. And that's what makes brands spread so fast is because people do talk to each other and now that talking is weaponized with social media. So when people talk about a brand, it goes everywhere into that audience. And so what you want is to make sure that you're giving them the kinds of experiences that are going to turn out well for you. <laughs> you don't want to give them bad experiences. You, you see what happened when someone writes a Yelp review or a TripAdvisor review or Amazon review. They can kill a product yeah. really quickly. So you don't want to let that happen. You want to, uh, you want to, in a sense, let your customers lead the company. Mm-hmm. They're the boss. The company, the customer is the boss. Uh, you are the servant. And when you start thinking about it that way, uh, you become pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you mentioned in the book that nowadays customers run companies. I mean, like they decide if the company eventually is going to be on the market or not. They do. Yeah. 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 So how can companies leverage that? Well, I think um, by social listening. Um, so that's a great thing about social media for companies is not to sell with it. I think that's useless. It's to listen. Mm-hmm. Because if you're listening to your customers, you kind of know what they need. You're learning when you make a mistake, they tell you. When you're doing something good, they tell you. They might have suggestions for where you, you should go next that you hadn't thought of. There's always a few people that are out in front of the pack that come up with great ideas. And so um, those all should be discussion points for leaders. They should listen to those things and say, what does it mean for us? I mean, is that something we should work with? Is it something we need to care about, you know? Um, so there also there should be people in the companies that are social listeners, and their and their job is to bring that news to the decision makers at the top on a constant basis. Here's what our customers are thinking. Here's what they think about us. Here's what they think about the competition. And this is what they need in their lives. This is who they want to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But how can companies create those unique buying tribes? How is the process? Well. Um, Usually the need already exists, so you have to find the need. And maybe there's a tribe already starting to form that you you say, wow, those people would really like our product. And they they talk online. Um, they have tribal leaders that we can approach. Um, it's a perfect fit. We could, we could use our resources to support that tribe in many ways. And um, we have, we're a good fit. And so... Why don't we approach that tribe to help them design our next product? Right. Why don't we start 
conversations with them, get them in on the ground floor so that we make something that they want. They already want it before we even make it. Mm -hmm. So it's about involving the customer in the process of creating the product or the service. Exactly. It's co-creating that product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. Coming to a close now, um, what are some skills that people will need for the upcoming years in order to build and set their brand apart from the others? All those things we were talking about is having sort of a, a, a brand-driven approach to business rather than a business-driven approach to branding. You know, mm -hmm. think about the customer first. But I think the skills you need are determined by the challenge that you set for yourself. So, you know, um, every company would have uh, different skill needs depending on what they were trying to do. It's your job to figure that what skills you're going to need. You have to figure that out. But um, I, in a general sense, I recommend, in my book, Meta Skills, I recommend five meta skills that everyone's going to need to succeed in, um, in the future where we're trying to outrun robots. Um, you can't outrun a robot by being more knowledgeable, for example, mm -hmm. or more, have no more facts or, you know, be faster or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You can only outrun it by being more human. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing a robot can never be. So, um, the, the, the five skills that will, the meta skills, a meta skill is a, uh, a skill that lets you learn other skills quickly. So they're, they're more general skills. They're master skills. Mm -hmm. So the master, master skills that I think we need are uh, feeling, seeing, dreaming, making, and learning. So feeling is um, developing your intuition and your uh, EQ or emotional quotient, your, your ability to empathize with people, customers especially, but also co-workers. So that's really important. And that has to be balanced by seeing. Seeing is uh, logic. It's systems thinking. It's... Uh, critical thinking skills, which uh, often we're not taught in school, and we can see we can see the result of not having critical thinking skills in the U.S. right now, and a lot of countries around the world. Um, the people like when they when they vote for um, their leaders, they they don't seem to be able to think past the last thing they said. You know, it's just they're they're not critical. So that's something we need to learn, and we need probably to teach that to ourselves then dreaming is really applied imagination. So it's the ability to imagine new things and the, that are practical. So practical dreaming, let's say. And then that has to be balanced by making skills. You have to know how to make stuff. If you can't make something, then it doesn't matter how well you dream. Your imagination can never be uh, expressed with, without uh, some design skills. So those two things can be balanced. And then finally, um, learning is really the ability to teach yourself. And mm -hmm. so that would be any way you do it. I mean, that can be by reading books or going to lectures or talking with friends or doing things, whatever it is. You have to know how you personally learn best. What's your learning uh, style? So those, those five things will lead you um, to a career where you can, um, you can be creative all the time, really enjoy yourself, get yourself into a position where you're not um, only doing what people are telling you to do and following their dreams, that you have a, a shot at, uh, you know, making your own dreams come real. And become real. It's wonderful. Um, what would be some book recommendations you would recommend to our audience that would like to get into this whole thing of design thinking, branding, and so on? I mean, you could go back to all the books that I've read. There's <laughs> probably 500, but um, I've tried to synthesize those in my books. So um, my books, I don't think they're, you know, my books are, are, are unique. Each one's unique because I follow my own rule. I zig when everybody zags or mm -hmm. zag when everybody zigs. So um, I, can, I can tell you that if you want to know about, I'll just go through what each book does. I get this question all the time when I do talks because all my books will be sitting on the table and people say, which one should I get? Well, it kind of depends on what you want to learn. <laughs> we, they're easy books to digest. They're, they take two hours to read, so they're easy, but you have to know what you want to learn. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn um, how to connect 
strategy and customer experience uh, just sort of a, as a company or as a uh, designer, let's say, who's working with companies, then the brand gap is the basic one. It lays out the whole territory. Every, and it's 14 years old now, but it's still, it still holds. And, um, if, and if you want that same kind of information updated for social media age, then you get the, the latest one, which is the brand flip. Mm -hmm. So it's the same material, but it's much more, it's talking more about audiences and how businesses run your com uh, companies, uh, excuse me, <laughs> customers run companies and why that's true and what you can do about it. So those two are kind of like bookends. If you just want to learn about uh, Zag, how to Zag, then Zag is the book for you. That's strictly about um, brand strategy, how to be different. Uh, if you want to learn about how to make uh, a culture more conducive to, to innovation, then the, the design full company. That's all about design thinking and uh, how to imbue, imbue your company with those kinds of skills. If you want to learn about how your personal skills can uh, help you in the future, then Meta Skills. Uh, and it's not a book for everybody. Meta Skills is a big, thick, deep book. You have to have uh, the ability to stick with ideas because it's it's basically painting a picture of a new world. Um, however, I think the Dutch are perfectly uh, capable of dealing with this kind of material. I've seen it before. Uh, you're very well educated and you can handle it. Um, and, and, and the Brits are really good too with this. So it's very popular in both those countries. Um, if you don't want to go through such a heavy book and you like the, the brevity of my other books, uh, the next book is called The 46 Rules of Genius. And that's the, that's the quick start version of meta skills, so mm -hmm. you can just read the the principles, you know, mm -hmm. the four to six things, um, and so that's it. And then I have a new book coming out that is about um, uh, building a culture around branding inside a company uh, from the view from the inside. So it's a uh, it's fictional. It's called Scramble. It's a fictional account of a company that has to redesign, rethink their business in five weeks, or they're going to be out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's leader is going to be removed and probably all the top people if they can't figure it out in five weeks. And so they have to scramble. Um, and the best way to tell that story is with fiction. So it's a fictional account of a company going through this. Um, and it's a real page turner. So that will be coming out next year. So those are my books. Uh, there's lots of other good books. Um, let me just think of a few seminal books. Um, the Innovator's Solution by Clay Christensen is really important. An older book called um, The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing by Trout and Reese uh, was formative for me, and it still holds true. Um, a very good book on the future of everything is um, What Technology Wants by Kevin Kelly. Uh, that'll scare you. Uh, but it's a very well-researched book. Um, and I'm excited I just got a book... Uh, by Wal uh, Walter Isaacson on mm -hmm. Leonardo da Vinci. It just came out yesterday. I've already started to read it, and it's going to be fabulous. And so he's a great role model for today. So the fact that he could uh, – he used design thinking. Uh, he connected art and science together, and he was the last one to do that. And the, and the reason he was the last one to do it is because he never got to publish his notebooks. Uh, so no one saw what he was doing. He was so secretive. Uh, that, you know, because he thought for competitive reasons it was good not to let this information out. But he never got around to doing it, and his assistant never did either. So the, all that stuff got hidden for about 200 years. And so that's why science went one way and heart went the other, and now we have to put it back together. So I think that's going to be a great read. That's a wonderful ending, Marty. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you.